Hello, I'm Lisa Gromlich. I serve as the Dean of the University of Washington's College of the Environment. And I wanna begin by acknowledging that the campus and buildings of the University of Washington are on the land of the Coast Salish peoples. This is land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip and Muckleshoot nations. So thank you for joining us today and welcome to our second online Amplify. Amplify is a series of conversations we hold at the College of the Environment that focus on issues around sharing science with society. And today we're gonna to talk with a true expert in the field about how we make our science communication more equitable and inclusive. But before I introduce our guest, I have a couple of housekeeping items. We are recording this discussion and we'll make it available on the college's YouTube channel shortly. We'll send out a follow-up email with that link. Second, if you have questions for Sunshine Menezes, please use the Q&A function in Zoom and we'll get to as many questions as we can. So on with the show. I am thrilled to have Sunshine Menezes join us today. Sunshine is the executive director of the Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island, which provides education, training, and resources to journalists, scientists, and science communicators to engage diverse public audiences in conversations about science and the environment. Importantly, Sunshine and her colleagues have been focusing much of their energy on inclusive SCICOM, which is a growing global movement to shift the traditional paradigm of science communication towards an approach that centers inclusion, equity, and intersectionality. So welcome, Sunshine. I'm eager to explore these topics with you tonight. And um, I'm gonna ask you the question that we always ask our guests, which is, Tell us about yourself and how the heck did you get connected to this SciComm space? Um, first of all, thank you, Lisa, and everyone at UW and the Amplify program for this invitation. It's really my pleasure to be here with you tonight. I wish I could be with you, like actually in person, but, but this will have to do. Um, uh, and I should also note, by the way, that I'm coming from the land of the Narragansett tribe. And in fact, I am literally just down the road from, from the Narragansett tribal community right now, but they lived in these lands for a very long time. Um, I am, let's see, how did I come into science communication? Um, I guess I started really in, in graduate school. Um, nope, that's not true. I started in high school. I uh, was a, a rainforest activist in high school. I'm just remembering this as we're talking and um, started this, this club called Teens Realizing Earth's Endangerment, which is really self-righteous tree, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was, I guess, doing science communication uh, when I was in high school by, you know, in a very deficit model way, by the way, mm -hmm. I was really like screaming from the rooftops and if people didn't agree with me, then that was their fault, um, not mine. So I have come a long way, I hope. Um, but more recently, I, I got involved as a graduate student at the University of Rhode Island with Metcalf Institute um, long before I became executive director. Um, and that was really my, my first true introduction to um, science communication and public engagement because I was interacting with professional journalists from all over the, the world, um, talking with them about my research and, um, and why I was interested in science. And it was the first time that I had been in a position to have to actually explain those things, you know, and mm -hmm. think through what I was trying to communicate in a more effective way. And then I had a Knauss Fellowship, one of the Sea Grant Fellowships. Um, so I worked for a congressman from New Jersey for a year. And that was also kind of a trial by fire in terms of science communication. I will never forget that the first time I wrote something for my boss and I gave it to the, the press secretary, the press secretary read it and was like, what is this? I, I can't use this, you know, like this is all science and I can't make any sense of it. So there are all of these experiences that I had that helped me understand that 
effective communication is really important and really hard. So, you know, I'm, oh gosh, there's so many things we could talk about. First of <laughs> all, I too spent a lot of my early youth yelling at people and found it didn't really work. And, and so was it really in the Canals Fellowship that you had that like, oh my God, this deficit model is not working? I mean, it's, it's interesting that one, it, it takes a while often to kind of come to that painful realization. That yeah, was that the, was the first you know? time. I yeah. mean, I didn't have that language for it at that time, um, but, but, but that's what it was. Absolutely. You know, it, it was my job not only to write things for my boss and to um, summarize issues for my boss, but also to prepare him for committee meetings and um, to meet with his constituents and to meet with other people who, you know, wanted access to him and um, to share his views on various issues and then to report back to him on their views. And, mm -hmm. um, and it really helped me get a better sense of why it's so important to, to get a lot of different people's opinions and, um, and make, you know, like proceed based mm -hmm. on all of this input rather than just like barging ahead as I did when I was a teenager and trying to like knock people over the head with a particular yeah. message. You know, so it's interesting because, um, oh, like a decade ago, you know, that was the, we got this language like deficit model and we all had this like sort of aha moments. Um, and then I feel like we've been sort of pausing, like we all know, like not to make that mistake anymore. But I think one of the things that's so interesting to me about your work is instead of just not doing deficit model, you've been much more proactive about thinking, well, what are we doing if we're not doing deficit model? And, and really been working through what does it mean to actually do inclusive science communication? So this kind of really positive vision of something that we're doing versus something we're avoiding, a mistake we're avoiding. So tell me a little bit about what inclusive science communication means for you. Sure. Um, well, I should first acknowledge that there are a lot of people who are working on this and that my thinking about this is constantly evolving and I have been um, taught and, um, and pushed in very good ways by a lot of people um, to get to, to where I am right now. Um, the, the group of people who I worked with to develop um, the Inclusive SciComm Symposium in 2018 really got us um, collectively thinking about this was um, we, we came together and kind of put our little like flag uh, on the ground um, to try to say what we think inclusive science communication is. So that's what I wanna share right now. Mm -hmm. um, so we argued that this is a complete paradigm shift that is that um, centers um, history, that it, it acknowledges histories of oppression and discrimination. Um, it, it centers the voices and experiences and knowledges of marginalized people and communities. Um, it really focuses on equity and on um, intersectionality. And um, it is, it's about questioning power and privilege. So this is definitely a radical shift from science communication as we have thought about it for a long time. And I don't mean to indicate at all that um, our thinking is novel here. This really builds on so many people, but we wanted to kind of pull a lot of this thinking together and, um, and talk about it within the context of science communication specifically. So as you gathered with your collaborators and started to map out this space. Um, <clears throat> what was motivating you? Why were you, why were you going there? Um, what were you seeing as the issues or the gaps or what were we, where were we failing? You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I will tell you for me, uh, this, this really came out of a few things in, in 2017. 
um, I was, I had been participating in um, some working groups. One of them was organized by CASE, the Center for the Advancement of Informal Science Education. Um, and it was this broadening participation task force. And it brought people together um, from informal science education and science communication, researchers and practitioners. Um, and we were having this incredible series of conversations that, were, that was really intended to bridge um, the silos of informal science education and science communication per mm -hmm. se. Um, and to come together to offer some, um, some thoughts specifically about broadening participation in the like NSF context. Yeah. So um, all of these incredible conversations, met all these great people, was thinking about new things, introduced to new literature. And then I also, um, within that same time frame, had gone to several conferences, um, science communication conferences, where the, the people on the stage were all, or almost all um, white men in, in very much positions of power and influence um, who were talking about science communication in ways that seemed really separate from all of the issues that I just identified a moment ago. Um, and I got really frustrated by it. And I, um, I often say like, I bitched about it on Twitter for a little while. And then I realized that was not the most effective way to, to um, address this problem. So that led to just thinking about what we could do and, and paying more attention to the people who were out there doing this work um, really from a starting point of inclusion and equity and intersectionality. So um, what I found as I started looking into this is that a lot of the people who were doing this were connecting via Twitter. Um, and that's great, but obviously Twitter is not going to, there are a lot of people who are not going to connect via Twitter. So that led to um, thinking, well, a, one of the big gaps here is just connecting the people who are doing this work, you know, bringing us together from all of these different spaces that we're working in um, so that we can learn from one another. And so that those people who um, are very new to thinking about these issues, um, can recognize that there are, are models to build on. You know, we don't have to remake the wheel. So that was our original goal, um, was to, to fill these, some of these gaps at least just by convening people. Um, I could go on about some of the, the gaps that I think that we have um, if you want, but, uh, but I don't know where you want to take it from here. So you know what? Hold that thought. Okay. And you know what? We did the classic thing that we do when we talk about this kind of insider conversation. One of um, our participants has said, what is the deficit model? Thank you, participant. Thank you. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Sorry. <laughs> do you wanna do that one, Sunshine? Sure, sure. So um, the deficit model, um, and I'm very sorry, I apologize for, for that jargon. Um, the deficit model, it refers to this um, very one-way transmission of information. So often in science communication, this is coming from an I am the expert, the like academic expert. I am going to share my knowledge with you, non-expert, lay person. Um, so it's a, it's a very one-directional kind of thing. Um, whereas what we're trying to move toward and as Lisa said, I mean, this has been an ongoing conversation for a while, but in practice, still, we see a lot of science communication that um, remains unidirectional rather than really building on um, multiple perspectives. And um, I mean, there's all these additional things that I raised in terms of inclusive science communication, but even just focusing on dialogue, um, conversation that is, you know, an exchange of information rather than a one-way transmission is moving away from the deficit model. Thank you, Sunshine. Um, you know, when I think about it for myself, I think about probably a lost decade of a being an early climate change researcher where I felt like my job was to, I didn't quite scream at people, but like scare the pants off of people yeah. about like the scariness of climate change. Um, and sort of ignoring how it could even be relevant 
to their life that sometime in 2040, the world will look quite different. This is back in 1990, you know, and, and sort of coming to realize like, oh, after a decade, that really, that didn't work. There was, there was no connection there. So, so then thinking about these, this inclusive science communication and ways it addresses gaps. Um, so to keep, kind of keep going where, you know, can we pick up where you were going, which is um, if we were to start to describe um, with more nuance what um, inclusive science communication looks like and how it, how it, how you practice it or how you and your colleagues imagine practicing it or training up, what, what kind of things, what kind of things you do? Um, well, well, let me start by saying that um, I, uh, I um, with Katie Canfield, just last fall, we produced this report that was um, a landscape study looking at um, 30 people. So Katie interviewed 30 people who are early leaders in this inclusive science communication space across all kinds of disciplines and sectors and, and settings. And um, what we found from those interviews was that um, there were three common traits that the people who are doing this work early and effectively share. Those are intentionality, reciprocity, and reflexivity. And once again, I want to note that we're building on the shoulders of giants here because those are not new ideas. Um, these are ideas that come that have been talked about for a long time in various spaces, but they have not been talked about together as this like... Um, this triad in science communication. So intentionality is really about being very thoughtful about who your audience is, about how um, um, you know, historically marginalized identities are both um, uh, represented in the work that you're doing and, and, um, and given power, like able to um, exert their power. Um, reciprocity is about this, this co-created benefit. So it's not just, um, you know, the communicator who is benefiting, um, but in fact, the, this intended audience is also benefiting and perhaps benefiting more in order for it to be equitable. Mm -hmm. um, and reflexivity, which is all about just reflecting on what you are doing and what you have done and adapting as needed to make sure that you are um, pushing forward equitable interactions. So those three things are really, so equity is at the center of those three mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And you can't separate any one of them in a scheme of things to be doing inclusive science communication. So it is just this continual um, reflection really on um, and all of the ways you are conceiving of your communication um, and your interactions, and the ways you're actually practicing them, the ways you are measuring them, what your objectives are, um, who's got power in, and who doesn't have power in the interactions, um, who's asking the questions to begin with. <laughs> um, you know, it, it is, in, in theory, these things might not sound super hard, in practice, they are very different from what many of us have been doing for a long time. And, um, and therefore it is this continual um, interrogation of yourself and um, your, your colleagues, you know, your collaborators to make sure that we're, we are um, not taking up all the space and that we're listening um, and you know, acting with other people, um, not for them, as is like my favorite quote from one of my favorite papers about being with and not for. Mm -hmm. So Sunshine, do you have a project you're currently doing where you feel like you're making headway in working within that framework? So what, you know, on a given day of the week, you wake up and in this, COVID world, you 
start connecting in a way that's intentional and reflexive and has reciprocity, what does it look and feel like? Well, you know, honestly, I like, I am trying to apply these things to everything I do now. Um, and um, I, so, you know, I apply this to how I create my course, so my courses that I teach. Um, I, I teach a, an environmental crisis communication course and a public engagement with science course. So I'm, I'm trying to apply all of those things to myself in my teaching. Um, I am trying to apply this in the ways that we develop Metcalf Institute programs. Um, you know, we don't do, Metcalf Institute doesn't do a lot of um, public engagement ourselves. We're really doing a lot of training um, primarily. You know, we, we certainly hold some public programs, but the majority of the work that we do is related to training. So I want to make sure that in the training that we're doing, we're applying these ideas. Um, it's, I'm applying it in terms of thinking about institutional change. You know, so at the University of Rhode Island, um, as at every institution these days, you know, there are many, many conversations happening um, in which we are um, trying to dismantle um, problematic structures. Yeah. So I find these, um, these traits helpful in that regard too. Um, I have, when we were, when we were prepping for this conversation, one of the things I think we talked about briefly was that I um, have this incredible group of friends. Um, we call ourselves the Community Ally Initiative. And it's, um, it's a small group of women of color who um, come together to learn from one another and, and push each other and think about ways that um, we, and support each other and think about ways that we can change things at URI. Um, and, and specifically, our original goal was to say like, what can, what can we learn together that's gonna help us help other people do this work better? So um, uh, we're applying these ideas, these key traits in those conversations, you know? Um, so yeah, like it, I feel that um, you may remember from the original Matrix, the Matrix movie, um, which came out when I was really very actively watching movies. Um, there, you know, there's a scene in early on where the main character um, is presented with a choice. Um, he can take the blue pill or the red pill, and I never remember which one's which, but you take one and you go back to your, your previous life where you didn't know anything about the reality. And you take the other one, I know you're really diving deeply into the reality and you can't ever unsee it. And I feel like that's what this work is, you know? Um, so um, anyway, yeah, I, you, you can't unsee these, um, you can't unsee oppression and marginalization once you really start paying attention to it. And I do not mean that I don't get things wrong. I get things wrong all the time, um, but at least I am better able to kind of open my own eyes and accept all the things I don't know and the ways that I need to learn. So I think one of the things that has happened in the last year, and it, it's been happening before and it will happen again, but we became much more acutely aware of people were seeing and talking about things that had been really easy to look away from. And all of a sudden people are looking at it. And what I think is interesting about what you just shared in terms of what is the practice of this looks like is that you do it in community. And yeah. I think of myself as a faculty member when we think about how we train our undergraduates, not graduate students, our postdocs to be scholars and, you know, like they write papers and, and science, you know, the old science communication was you learned how to do better PowerPoints so they weren't like stupid, you know. Yeah. Like, so, or, or they were like attractive or I don't know, they weren't offensive, you know. Like, right, right. <laughs> um, it was a very low oh, bar. Right, right. And so what, what you're saying, and I'm looking out at all of my UW people out there, is part of your work is pausing, assembling a group of people who are holding each other, I'm kind of putting words in your mouth here, but who are holding each other accountable to kind of bring their best selves forward and to 
give each other feedback and really push through the parts of this stuff that is reflexive and is, um, at one point you talked about asking the right questions, that is, is asking the right questions. And that's, that's not something that you do once every six months when you've got nothing to do on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> it's, it's part of the practice. Yeah. And I Absolutely. think um, I kind of just, I'm kind of wanting to pause with that because I think um, it's, this isn't just do a workshop get a skill set it's a you know it's the red pill world of like you see things you can't unsee them you keep seeing more and you see them in community so yes you can put those words in my mouth all day long because they're absolutely um how i feel mm -hmm. the community is you feel like um the online world has helped <laughs> you, you said this funny thing like i pitched on twitter for a while <laughs> like really you know has the online world helped or hindered that? Both, you know, both. Um, there are, I mean, so one of the amazing things about Twitter, so which is by far the social medium that I am most active on. Um, one of the great things about Twitter is that it has become um, a, a, a really powerful platform for, especially for, um, people who have been marginalized by virtue of their race or gender or sexuality or ability or whatever it is um, for a very long time to be able to scream from the rooftops if they want to, you know, and, and to have a lot of people listen to what they have to say. And, you know, there are all those conversations about cancel culture, yada, yada, which um, I think is often um, a smokescreen because the reality is, yeah, like there's some very unhealthy discourse, if you can even use that word for it, that happens on Twitter, for sure. Um, but there's also some really important discourse that happens on Twitter. And it's not, it's not all like rosy and yeah. important. Yeah. You know, a lot of it is hard and ugly. And there's, it's important. <laughs> it's important. And, and these conversations need to be happening in many places. Um, so there is, there is great value in that way. Um, and, in some other ways too, I mean, you can do incredible public engagement on Twitter. I mean, I just tweeted the other day, about one of my inclusive Psycom heroes, um, Monica Feliu Mojer, who, um, works with Ciencia Puerto Rico, and they're doing just incredible public engagement related to COVID, um, mm -hmm. in Spanish, um, specifically targeting the Puerto Rican diaspora. Um, incredible work. Um, and a lot of that is, is done on Twitter. It's not all on Twitter, but, th but they're doing a lot on social media, you know? Um, so there's just really great value that can be found. But yeah, of course, there's also a lot of distractions that come down to like name calling and um, there's a lot of horribleness that happens on Twitter and on other, I'm sure on other social platforms too. Yeah, it, there is, and I, I think um, we get better at sort of calling people in, and also, you know, a, a shout out to my colleague at UW, John Meyer, who in the science communication training, you know, really does have people sort of talk about, okay, if, if you do this, this is what you may encounter, and and this is what you need to be ready for, and and. And it's, 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 there's a culture to it and, and yep. there's, there's ways of engaging. What about, um, so outside of social media, um, what are other ways people can hone their skills at the kind of listening and reflexivity you know, there's books, there's like, you know, yeah. there's, um, you know, are, do you have other suggestions? Because this is kind of the amplify thing is that we're trying to sort of share some best practices mm -hmm. and sure. recruit people um, to this. Well, so the, uh, it is no small thing to build the skills to have this kind of dialogue. Um, you know, these hard 
conversations, um, especially across difference. So that is um, like a singularly important skill that is very hard to gain without practice, perhaps yeah. impossible to gain without practice. Um, and that practice means you're going to mess up, you know, mm -hmm. and part of this whole, all of this work is acknowledging that I am going to mess up at some point. And instead of what has really um, prevented, so another really good friend of mine, Dr. Kendall Moore at URI is a filmmaker and she Many people have seen um, the film series that she's developed called Can We Talk um, about um, sense of belonging and STEM among um, racial and ethnic minorities. And she's incredible. Um, we, now I just totally lost my train of thought. I got so worked up about Kendall that I forgot where I was going with that. Kendall says something really- Well, we were talking about communicating across difference and, um, above and beyond or in addition to sort of social media and making mistakes and and having the grace oh. to forgive oneself and move on yes thank you so so she um says often that um one of the real problems for people having these honest conversations with regard to race um is the fear among many white people to not to, to mess up to say something that is the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the reality is that if you are too afraid to engage in what is likely to be a, a hard conversation, you're part of the problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, it's, it's hard, it is scary, I get that. But um, we, have to, we have to find the ways um, and the opportunities to build those skills. We need to do it with our students, we need to do it with ourselves, um, we need to do it with our, our colleagues and our partners. Um, and yeah, that, like I am, I'm kind of obsessed with, with this idea right now. I've been thinking about this a lot. I'm, I have this research project with a couple of colleagues that is specifically looking at, um, at this in the context of the Inclusive Sitecom Symposia, especially, and like how we can build on this within that symposium setting and, and then beyond within other trainings um, because it's just so important and it's not something, it's just not a skill set that people in STEM are um, taught nor encouraged to build. And, um, <laughs> and it's so important. Like, I mean, and so here we are, um, you know, talking in the, in the context of an, an environmental college um, where um, the histories of racism are so deeply rooted mm -hmm. in environmental science mm -hmm. um, and in, um, in environmental issues. And I mean, and sure, we talk about th that to some degree, but I think that a lot of environmental scientists um, haven't really reflected on this um, in very deep ways. Like, how am I part of this problem? How, mm -hmm. how am I part of the solution? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's just like such an important skill set that we need to spend a lot more time on. So I'm watching the, the time and I think I feel like I get one more chance to ask you a question <laughs> and then all you people get ready with Q&A because that time is almost here. Um, so as someone that you know does this training and works with people um, in more formal settings, and then also has like your own practice, um, as I'm, I'm kind of gathering up a couple of things that I'm guessing you would say, but would love to hear you sort of talk about um, inclusive science communication, really as a daily practice. Like, how do you start, and how do you start and how do you not give up? You know, we all, it's, you know, it's mid-February. We all had those things like, oh, January 1st, I'm gonna like work out every day or whatever, I need sugar, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> politics. I let that one go. <laughs> um, and so it's, you know, like there's these people are gonna be like, oh, I just heard sunshine right. and now I'm gonna do this. And it's like, okay, what do you do 
And then what do you do a week from now? And what do you do right. a month from now? And Okay, yes, great, great question. Um, okay, let's, um, I think something that we can do as a starting point is to consider, um, this is a super starting point, is to consider the notion of objectivity in science. Oh, yeah, yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> I mean, it's this assumed thing. And I, once upon a time, used to like spout off about how I love science so much because of its objectivity. Um, until I learned more about the reality of the fact that as a human being, I am not capable of being fully objective. I can try, I can do my best, but I can't be truly yeah. objective. So um, this notion is something that we need to, we need to completely shift our thinking on. So I think that, I mean, and so again, this is still a daily practice, right? Like that is definitely not a question that you like think about and then you're like, okay, done. Uh, Good. I'm all, I'm all set with this notion of objectivity, especially if it's brand new to you. But, um, but I think that's a really great starting point. And, um, and also thinking about, um, we, we talk um, kind of a, a starting point for a lot of, um, a lot of people in, in the sciences is to think about outreach and stakeholders. So uh, here's another thing that you can like kind of flip on its head. So I, I have been urging people to go away from the use, the use from using the term outreach mm -hmm. because I feel that it is um, part of this very hierarchical sense of, of who's in and who's out. You know, like generally it's meant like those of us who are in academia are reaching out to yeah. the community. And I get where that came from, of course, but, um, but it's pretty hierarchical and, um, and determinative, you know, like, well, we know the things and they don't know the things. So we will reach out to them with the things. Um, so thinking about that also, and, um, and with the, with the idea of stakeholders even, and, um, you know, I'm thinking right now about conversations I've, I've had with colleagues recently, um, about how stakeholders might be involved in a project. And again, often this starts from a very transactional viewpoint um, mm -hmm. for many academics. Mm -hmm. um, the, the grant proposal says that we have to have stakeholders. And so we're gonna like identify some people and we're gonna call them up every once in a while and say, this is what we're doing, what do you think? And um, there you go, stakeholder engagement, done. And again, that's, that's, um, it's not a, it's certainly not equitable. Um, it's not intentional. It's not reciprocal. <laughs> it's not reflexive. <laughs> it's none of those things. So, so I guess I would say that all of that, those three ideas are um, a really good way to like kind of start engaging and thinking about this. Certainly like the reading and the listening is really, really important too, but it really, I think starts with just having some conversations with yourself. Um, and, and of course with others, this, this community aspect that you noted before is a really important piece of this because, because of the value of all the different perspectives, because of the accountability. Um, but, but you, you have to kind of like get straight with yourself, um, before you can start having these conversations with other people. Sunshine, I love that. I love that answer. I also have to admit, I'm filtering in at this through the perspective of a dean and a sort of member of the sort of academic hierarchy that you refer mm -hmm. to, um, where I really think that we also need to take that kind of thinking and take it all the way up into our administration that, you know, the role of, particularly we're both at public universities, the role mm -hmm. of a public university isn't this loading dock of, right. here you go community, we've educated your young people <laughs> with a little bit of debt. And now here's a chunk of science and, right. and what it means to really be in community. So um, we've got questions. Great. I love this. Okay. Um, this is from Abigail. Thank you, Abigail. Is there a community SciCom partnership 
that you are that you really are excited about or admire or what aspects do you like about it? I don't mean to ask you if you just give one token example, if you wanna talk about more. So like she's saying, is there one, but you could also go on and on. So once again, a SciComm partnership and sort of mm -hmm. Abigail's on it, that it's like partner um, that you are excited about or admire. Yeah, yes, there are a bunch. Um, one that, um, comes immediately to mind is the work of um, Monica Ramirez Andriota at University of Arizona. So she's an environmental toxicologist and she has been collaborating with a couple of communities in Arizona um, on these community science and slash community-based participatory research programs um, over, I don't know, like 10 years or so maybe, um, that are, so one of these communities is situated um, adjacent to a Superfund site, and they were concerned about whether they could grow their own food or not in their soil. Was it safe for them to do that? So the research project is, is trying to explore that. Um, along the way, so the, the community and Monica's lab together crafted the research questions. Um, they together crafted the, the research protocols. They together crafted the, um, they together did the analyses and, and the interpretations of the data. They together created um, a, a communication and engagement strategy to talk about the results with the community. Um, it's incredible. They, and they've created all of these these beautiful um, like books, they, like uh, booklets, you know, um, mm -hmm. like they're they're they pay um, members of the community. So I, I might she has these two different projects, and I might be con, um, mm -hmm. confusing them right now. But at least in one of these projects, um, she the the lab pays um, people from the community to serve as. So this is a um, primarily Spanish speaking community. Um, so they have someone and there's a name for it and I can't come up with the name they have for this person's role, but this person is specifically there to regularly go out into the community and have conversations with people about this project and make sure that, you know, they're like on board with it and everything is, you know, do they have any concerns? Are there any new things that they want to um, bring into the project? Um, but that compensation is a big piece of yeah. this, you know, like they're not just saying, hey, why don't you go do this? Because it's good for everybody. They're saying, hey, would you do this? And how do you want it to work? And we're going to give you money for doing that work. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so that's one of my favorite examples. I just think that the stuff that they've been doing is fantastic on so many levels, like from a research perspective, from a public engagement perspective, from a, from a um, even kind of like more um, dissemination of information perspective. Well, you know, a couple of things I hear in that example, which I love also in part because of many years living in that part <laughs> and knowing a bit about that project actually, um, is the long-term engagement. Yeah. You know, there's, um, you know, we've had situations from the major science funders where you have a project and you have like broader impacts and so for three years you like engage and then you go away and um it's interesting because I feel like I've really learned from my public health and environmental toxicology kinds of um and also from um land grant and sea grant extension the the role of these really long-term trusted relationships where you actually really start to learn more about the situation of the knowledge, not just the knowledge. Yeah. Um, and then thinking about how, you know, there's this notion of legitimacy, like what is, you know, I, th I think we sometimes think like science can be actionable if it, you know, at the end of our paper has like three action steps or something. Well, it's only actionable if it is legitimate to the people that are taking the action. And I love what you're talking about. It's like all these ways we actually, create with others something that has that kind of deep legitimacy. Um, it's really inspiring work. Okay, 
Sunshine, here's a fun question from a sort of insider. Here we go. Both of you are diverse in ways that are not necessarily outwardly visible. How does that inform or impact your work in SciComm and inclusive science communication? You go first. <laughs> um, oh, great, great question. Right. Um, so I am white and I'm Latina and I have metastatic cancer. Um, so uh, like I have, I have these perspectives that um, you may not know about from looking at me because um, I look like a healthy white woman um, and I carry a, a great deal of privilege. Um, what that means, what I'm coming to accept with that is that that means that um, right with great power comes great responsibility kind of, you know, like I, I um, need to find the ways that I can exercise my privilege um, everywhere I can. And, um, and I have to note that like, I've always been um, a, a rule follower my whole life. Like I'm very much a rule follower and to such a degree that, that many people who know me well have made fun of me about it. Um, so, you know, as I get older and um, care less about what people think about me, um, I am, and learning as part of this work, you know, I realize, you know, th there, uh, there are a lot of rules out there that um, should not be followed. Um, so I'm finding some strength in that um, and, um, and reminding myself of my responsibilities <laughs> accordingly. Um, also, I'll note that because um, I have had all of this experience in, in healthcare, because I've I've had like three instances with cancer and um, over the last nine years or so. Um, so I talk about privilege, you know, like I have immense privilege in this way because I, um, I have really great health insurance and I am, um, you know, a straight cis white woman. And so there are all of these things that, that I carry into a setting with medical professionals that gives me great advantage. And that is part of the thing that has also, it's one of the things that has really influenced my thinking um, about all of this. How about you, Lisa? Yeah. So I am a cis queer white woman with privilege. And I feel very fortunate to be the mother of two daughters, one of whom is mixed race, one of whom is black. And it's been um, the experience of, as a woman in science, who's queer, always having, you know, a certain amount of sort of insider, outsider, kind of a, a bit more awareness of the voices that were being left out. Um, I came to motherhood a little bit later in life. I call it my geezer motherhood model because I adopted my youngest daughter when I was 50. She was three days old. So, um, you are and, an inspiration to me, by the way. Okay, so I love that. Oh, yeah, you know, like <laughs> what's my logical clock? What the hell? Um, so, in becoming the mother, in particular, of my black daughter, seeing seeing the world through her eyes was something that has um, very much increased, increased my sensitivity to where voices are not heard and where people are marginalized and, and where people, you know, are delegitimized a lot. And, um, and you know, that's in the context of the privileged life of, I mean, I'm a freaking college dean, you know, like, you know, like that's, well, there's a whole lot of privilege there, but it's um, all of these pieces. And I appreciate the person that asked us these questions because as we, um, in my mind, for, I'm not speaking personally, that, that authentic work, that waking up every morning and saying, besides the Zoom meetings and the paperwork or whatever, you know, <laughs> how am I going to keep this practice of authentic, reflexive engagement going and, you know, why am I doing it and who am I doing it for? 
keeping those those really core um, identities sort of close to your heart is really important because otherwise it it's work, you know. It's it has its moments. Yeah. Um, so okay, I think this is perhaps our last question. Okay. So I don't have my glasses on. Um, Sunshine, yes. do you have a quote unquote must read that you recommend for those of us who really want to dive in but are just getting started? Mm. Maybe not one, could be a couple. Hard. <laughs> um, boy, that's so hard. Um, there's so many. Um, well, okay, I'm going to give a little shout out to a friend of mine who's got a book coming out really soon. I haven't read this book, but I have every confidence, sight and seen that it's going to be a must read as soon as it's out in April. Um, this is written by Faith Kearns, who has been doing a lot of work related to um, science communication and public engagement for a long time, but especially what she calls relational engagement. Um, which is all about building relationships to make sure that um, you're, you're actually having the, the greatest possible um, effects. And um, she, I know that she uh, interviewed a bunch of great people in, for this book and she's a great writer. And so I'm sure that it's going to be amazing. So look for that. You can pre-order it right now. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are so, honestly, there are so many um, papers that, um, I could recommend, and I'd be happy to share some of them um, with you afterward, um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you guys could distribute them. Um, they're, um, you know, um, yeah, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. There are a lot of things, and I'd be happy to share some resources afterwards. Oh, okay. There's some really good questions. <laughs> I can't resist this one. Because I just, whoever asked this, thank you. Okay, Sunshine, do you believe that science education is sort of a political act? Because although it's supposed to be objective, it is still rooted and shaped by different cultures and is typically taught from a Western perspective that ignores indigenous ways of knowing. So the question is, is science education a political act? Yes, yes, it should be. It should be, I guess is my answer. Um, and if it's not, we're, we're not, we're not serving our students. Um, there, a lot of people would be very, very uncomfortable with this. I know that. But, um, but again, this is part of, of um, the questions that we need to be asking ourselves. Um, by acknowledging that, that there is no such thing as scientific objectivity, we then kind of, there's like a logic problem here, right? Like if you deny that you cannot be truly objective as a scientist, that there is, that there therefore are some kind of inherent political, not partisan, but like political considerations related to science, related to science education, um, then yes, ipso facto, I think that um, it is a political act, it should be. Um, and, and not just the, um, the ways that we approach, um, the, the, I'm trying to like connect these two dots here because another thought just came into my head as I was saying this, um, like not just in overall the ways that we approach our, our teaching um, but also what it is we are trying to equip our students to do in the world. Um, if we want, I mean, we have known in science for a long time, we, we want our students to be able to, you know, ask questions and, and come up with, with the, uh, apply the appropriate methods and um, do these statistical analyses and think critically and yada, yada. Um, but if we aren't asking the right questions, then, then everything that's coming thereafter might have a little asterisk on it, maybe a great big one, you know? So, so yeah, I mean, my feeling is that yes, it should be. And again, this is another thing that I'm coming to um, later myself. You know, I didn't start out as someone who 
viewed science education as a political act, but I more and more am and am letting my um, my freak flag fly as as a teacher um, because I think it's important to acknowledge that you know this like pretending that we just as it's ridiculous to pretend that we can be fully objective as scientists, it's ridiculous to pretend that we can stand up in front of a class and um, and not bring ourselves into that classroom. Yeah. Oh, sunshine. Well, first of all, really love these questions that we got and that yeah. that last question. Um, to me, I mean, I don't know who out there asked that, but um, I feel like there's a way, you talked about coming to it later in your life and and I did sort of as well after you know a decade of trying to throw climate models at people. Um, and I think, I think one of the things we see in our classrooms is our students, you know, already get this. Yes. And, and so, you know, in the same way that, you know, we can throw out the sort of deficit model, <laughs> we're the faculty and we are like imparting this to the students, you know, there's, there's so much we learn from how they're seeing the role of science and knowledge and who asks the questions. Yeah. Oh, sunshine. So I am just so grateful that you came to us and <laughs> spent some time with us. Um, you know, I do so love our, I know we've got non-UW people out here, but I do so love um, the UW community that has gathered across campus, often physically around this. And so normally we would be, you know, having lovely beverages and hors d'oeuvres and a view of sunset over the lovely Puget Sound. And we can't offer you that, but <laughs> um, okay. And, um, and I want to make sure that you, um, I am getting some. Ah, okay. The people, you know, I'm not quite, you know how on TV, like there's somebody that <laughs> tells you what to say. I don't quite have that, but I do, have, I do have some bigger brains out there that are saying, Lisa, we, everybody, all of you out there, we have your email and we are going to send you links. I think we're promising two things. Sunshine's favorite papers and a link to the Zoom, right? I think that's what we promised. Um, okay, so once again, Sunshine, till we meet again in SciComm land, thank you for being with us. Um, thank you everyone who joined us from here in Seattle and all over. You Chicago people, we know you're out there. Um, and <laughs> um, stay safe, stay well, wear your mask, stay healthy, and until next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.